Hi, my name is Dutch Hedrick, and I'm of Rube's Good Brain Coffee in Kitchell, North Carolina. And I just want to talk a little bit about rates of rise and why it's important. And I guess we'll start by uh, defining rate of rise by saying that it's the, according to Scott Rayo, it's the progression of bean temperature per unit time during a roast. And let's just say uh, that's, well, it's in Fahrenheit or Celsius, depending on what you're roasting in. And uh, for instance, um, if you're at 300 degrees and your rate of rise is at 20 degrees per minute, then by the uh, by a minute's time, you will be at 320 degrees. And that's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, what happens, however, to the bean? when you have a steadily decreasing rate of rise as recommended by Scott Rayo. Now, let me first start by saying that unless I'm mistaken, and, and if I am, you can point it out to me and put it in the comment section down below. I don't think that Scott Rayo actually says what the cause for a steadily declining rate of rise is for producing at least the uh, potential of great coffee. He does say that there is a correlation between a steadily dec declining rate of rise and great coffee, but as far as what's causing it, he doesn't make any claims, and I don't feel that he necessarily has to, because, well, what, what Scott Rayo, the lesson of Scott Rayo is that by keeping lots of da data on your coffee roasts and comparing the data and, and pointing out which roasts are good and which roasts are not, you can actually pick out a pattern of what produces great coffee and what tends not to produce great coffee. And as far as what is causing all of that, that, that may not matter so much. And this is actually something that we've known for a long time. Uh, when I first started getting into the, the uh, coffee roasting business, we didn't talk about rate of rise. I mean, I don't know of anyone who was. Uh, we may have been following a steadily declining rate of rise without even knowing it. Just because, for instance, when I started out, we would put, let's say, 60 kilo of green into a roaster. We would start it at the same charge temperature every time. And we wouldn't make any adjustments to the gas because... Frankly, I couldn't make any adjustments to the gas. It was programmed to decline, uh, turn the gas down to halfway about uh, around the time first crack was happening. But that wasn't me doing anything. That was just the way it was doing it on its own. All my job was as a coffee roaster was to get there and look at the bean development at the end of the roast. And when I, it looked about the way it looked like it should to us, then I would let the coffee out of the roaster, we would Agtron it, and uh, and it, would, it needed to be within one or two degrees of uh, either plus or minus a target Agtron. And that's all we did. So as far as rate of rise goes, we didn't ever talk about it. Um, I think it was probably around 2012, maybe a little later, uh, people just start talking about Rate of Rise because Scott Rayo published his book, The Coffee Roaster's Companion. And uh, it was very, very eye-opening. Uh, it kind of, at least from my perspective, it kind of revolutionized the way we all thought about coffee roasting. And which is great because we're always looking for for some bit of information that could help simplify coffee roasting, um, something that we're missing, a missing piece of the puzzle. Now, let me just say that it's great to understand the science behind roasting coffee, and the more we understand, the more control we have, but we don't need to wait until we understand the science perfectly to be able to roast great coffee. And, uh, and the way I think of it is, I, I think of astronomers, for instance, hundreds of years ago, 
who would look up at the stars and they would notice what they call retrograde motion, which was to their, from their perspective, it looked like the outer planets would turn back on themselves and go backwards before turning back again and going in the, uh, or their original direction. And they created complex models with uh, spheres within spheres to explain what this retrograde motion was. And what, we, what they didn't know back then was that the Earth was not in the center of the solar system. And it was actually at the third planet of the sun. And what they were seeing was uh, the the difference between uh, the when, whenever we would pass them in in our orbits. I don't want to get too far into it, but here's what the, my point is: they didn't understand the planets enough to exactly explain accurately what was going on with the planets, but they didn't need to for their purposes. Uh, which was essentially to predict where the planets were going to be at a given time. So, yeah, it's great to understand what's going on in the coffee. And the more we understand, the more, the more control we have when we roast coffee. However, we just need to know enough to be able to pr predict great coffee. Now, you have your, all your data points, right? You have your your bean temperature, you have your environmental temperature, you have your rate of rise, you have all your sensory cues when uh, you hit the stage where it smells like wet grass or dry hay or baking bread, etc., etc. You know when first crack starts. All these are great things to know when you're roasting a coffee. And they're great to know because by... Keeping all these things consistent, you will be able to predict properly, accurately enough, when to let that coffee out of the roaster. Okay, now, the thing is, if you are not consistent with all these things through your roasts, you're going to have a little more trouble predicting where to let that coffee out of the roaster. It's not going to be impossible but you're just going to have to think about it a little more as you're roasting the coffee. Now, why is it that rate of rise is so important? Why is it important to have a steadily declining rate of rise? Let me just say that I think it has a lot to do with the fact that coffee is roasted from the outside in. And you may hear a lot of people saying things like convection roasters, uh, roast from the inside out. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I've had people telling me that over and over and over again. And just from my own experience, I would think about it and it didn't make sense to me that it would roast from the inside out. Because whenever I would roast coffee on a con uh, typical conduction roaster, as we used to call them, and uh, I would put it on the Agtron, you would measure the, the darkness of the coffee on this machine called a Nagtron, and you, you may know what it is. If, if not, then maybe I'll go into it more later. Essentially, an Agtron measures the light which is reflected from the machine going back into the machine. So, a darker coffee is going to have a lower rating than a lighter coffee. That implies that if you're measuring the actrine of the outer bean, that's going to be darker than when you grind the coffee and then measure the actrine of the uh, ground coffee, okay? Um, so, you know, I, I, I came close to saying the inner bean. Uh, that implies that when you grind the coffee, you're not getting the outer bean's darkness as well. But that's going to be mixed in there. So it's essentially a whole bean actron versus a ground actron. Now, when I first started roasting, our goal was to have at least a 10 point spread between the uh, outer bean actron and the ground actron. So if the actron was measuring, let's say, um, 50 for the uh, outer bean, and you ground the, the, the coffee and then put it back on the actron, it would say 60 or so. 
Um, if it was any smaller, then it would be ind indicative of a coffee that was uh, a, a bit flatter, okay? Um, I hope I, I'm, I'm explaining this well enough. Now, um, the thing is, when, when we start roasting on uh, recirculating uh, roasters, roasters which recirculate the air, I was told that the, the, uh, these roasters, these convection roasters, um, and that's a bit of a misnomer too, uh, tended to roast from the inside out. Um, like I said, I don't think that's necessarily true. Now, they say that the, the beans, uh, the, the, the air penetrates the beans on these convection roasters, and, and that's why they roast from the inside out, but it still doesn't make sense to me. Um, especially due to the fact that I do know that when roasts on these, uh, these recirculating air roasters, um, such as a Loring, when they're measured on an Actron, they're still darker on the inside, on the outside than they are on the inside. For instance, um, I looked up some old roasts that we had done where I used to work, so I know that was... These were done on a Loring. And on one, it said 54 degrees uh, whole bean Agtron, ground Agtron, 74, okay. Um, on another, it said 59, uh, an Agtron of 59 on the whole bean, 79 on the ground Agtron. So in each case, there's about a 20 point differential between the whole bean Agtron and the inner bean Agtron. Now, here's what I think. Why is it that we need a steadily decreasing rate of rise? Why is that important? Well, let, let me just say that, one, once you've developed a portion of the bean, you can't go back on it. You can't unroast the bean. And so if the bean is roasting from the outside in, if you scorch the outside portion of the bean, you're not going to do anything more as that roast progress, but burn that part of the bean more. So it may be raw on the inside, but on the outside it's already scorched. So you can't undo that damage. So um, let, me, let me continue by saying that if you have a rate of rise of let's say 20 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Now, you want to evenly roast the bean from the outside in. Now, if you put on the gas a bit more and uh, you actually burn the outside of the bean a bit more than you wanted, like I said, it's just the same as if you dropped it into a hot roaster and scorched the outer part of the bean. Um, you cannot unroast what you've already roasted. So, what that means is, if you want to consistently know where you are in the roast, you need to consistently have a rate of rise that is consistently falling. Therefore, from roast to roast, you know that the outer portion of that bean isn't going to be more roasted by by the time you get to the end of that roast than by the time you get to the end of any other roast. You see what I'm saying? Uh, if, if, I guess if you need clarification, just ask questions and I'll, I'll try to answer them the best I can. Now, here's another thing. One thing I've noticed is that the faster the roast is, the more of a differential there is between the outer part of the bean and the ground actron. So what I've noticed is that at a certain point these huge differentials might actually have uh, coffee that tastes under roasted. It may look roasted on the outer part of the bean, but if you have not taken the time to sufficiently develop the inner part of the bean, it's going to have a harsh acidity. You haven't developed your sugars uh, adequately enough. So at that Maillard uh, phase, 
you're going to want to not blow through it too quickly, but you want to gently go through it, not too fast, not too slow. We're looking for balance here. We're looking for balance and we're looking for consistency from roast to roast, okay? Um, now, uh, I guess that's about all I have to say at this point. Um, uh, these are all issues which can be a little, a little complicated. And like I said before, the, the more you try to simplify roasting, uh, the more difficult it can be. So I, I'm not going to come out and have a rule, for instance, that in order to have a great roast, you need to have a spread in your Agtron rate, ra ratings that's about 10, 10 points or 12 points. Um, when I first started, we were saying maybe 10, maybe 12, um, but something that's 20, a 20 point spread would have been crazy to think about. Um, however, and we, we actually, I have actually seen 20 point spreads, 20 point or more spreads back then, and they generally were not very good coffees. But that wasn't because the spreads were 20 points. The reason was because uh, we were roasting smaller batches than we were used to roasting, so they didn't go through the Maillard phase as, uh, as we would have liked. And um, not that we knew what, what that was necessarily. And so there was a huge spread, the roast was too fast, and uh, the differential was too big for that, uh, for that reading. Um, a lot of this had to do with some, some of our clients would insist that they want the outer bean to look a certain way. And their idea of consistency was the outer bean looked the same way every time. However, they would order coffees that were just for them and they would ask for different size roasts. So um, a lot of times that just messed up the consistency and, uh, and, and just kind of messed everything up. But they didn't really care because they were looking for uh, consistency of how it looked, not how it tastes. And uh, as coffee roasters, obviously we should be looking for more consistency in how our roasts taste from roast to roast, not how they look. So. Um, I don't want to ramble too much about this, so uh, I guess um, I could be a little more focused by hearing what you guys have to say, asking questions, and and therefore I can respond a little more uh, a little more succinctly. So anyway, be sure to like and share and subscribe, do all those things uh, because this actually helps um, the communication. Uh, me communicate with as many people out there um, and like I said the the um, the goal is to get a good conversation started between all of us so um, in the meantime happy roasting happy sipping <laughs> sorry happy roasting happy brewing and happy sipping it's a very late night at this point so you probably hear in my voice Thanks for bearing with me. Thank you for your time and good night.